Uh, so this is the um, Python for data science or data analysis, oops, uh, GitHub repo that John. Hello? Oh, that John created for us. Uh, here is the link. And um, I put in a pull request last night. And so when the pull request gets pulled or gets approved, then the the new Porto book will be available on this repo. Um, it's not up there yet, but hopefully soon. Um, and so just to really briefly walk through how to update the, the notes for this book club, um, the R for Data Science uh, community and uses uh, these books to ju just keep track of like the important highlights from and learning objectives from the book. Um, if you're familiar with Git and GitHub, what you can do is you can fork this repository and then um, I'll bring it over to uh, your account. And then from here, you can clone a copy of uh, this fork onto your computer. And so uh, just to pull it up really fast, the book is built on Porto, which is a new uh, technical publishing platform. Um, and uh, what's great about Porto is it takes things like if you're familiar with our markdown documents, Jupyter notebooks, just regular markdown documents, and has a lot of uh, features and makes them into shareable formats, like um, like a website, like you'll see in a second, uh, uh, create like uh, decks and, and PDFs and all sorts of documents. Um, the document, uh, the documentation is really, really good. So if you are brand new to either Quarto or all those kind of like literate program, er, um, uh, literate programming like sort of systems, then highly recommend just uh, starting here from the get started. Uh, you can install Quarto if you don't haven't already uh, on your various um, uh, OS, and then. Uh, you can also use the tools that you would like. And so, um, for example, like I've usually used RStudio with uh, with Quarto, but since uh, we're reading a Python book and I want to get familiar with the other IDEs, like now I'm using Jupyter Lab and there are really clear instructions on how to get started. And so once you have cloned it into your uh, onto your desktop or or wherever, um, you can. Uh, start adding to the book. So whenever it's your chapter, you can go ahead and add um, the the notes that you would like to share and and keep um, you know saved for for others and other cohorts in the future. So these are the files that make up the book. And if you'd like to see, this is what the book uh, actually looks like. It has like a welcome, and then on the left here will be the table of contents that. Um, we'll outline all of the chapters and their notes, et cetera. Uh, right now, <clears throat> excuse me, we have it for the preliminary chapter, and here are the notes. Um, thank you for sharing them. And uh, in addition, if you there we go, <laughs> if you go here um, into the files of the book. You can just see an example of what things look like. So I, like I mentioned, Quarto can render Jupyter notebooks just as they are. You don't have to um, change uh, anything, just make sure, except for the YAML at the top, like so. Uh, and so if that is what you're comfortable with, uh, it could just look like that. If you want to uh, dip your toes into Quarto, if you haven't already, um, the a I think the VS Code has like a really good extension. This is just what it looks like on Jupyter Lab. Um, again, the similar sort of YAML. And then, um, if you're familiar with R Markdown, this sort of like mix of code and uh, and Markdown, and, and you can write your your notes out this way. So here are the examples in case they're helpful for you. So say uh, you've just presented a chapter, you want to put your notes up. Uh, so um, how I would do it, at least, is you want to create a file for um, the chapter, like the main page of the chapter, and then your notes and anything else that you want to add. So if you have exercises you want to include or anything like that, let's say, um, like, chapter two, you main that key, uh, let's just do a markdown file. And this will create um, a 
file for you that you can call, like you can match it with the first one. I forget the name of this chapter, I'm sorry, but chapter two. And save it. And then um, uh, write your learning objectives here. And then for your actual notes, create another uh, file that's like notes. And let's say this one, you want it to be a Python notebook. Yeah. Okay, let me try that again. I'll just do a uh, markdown for now. And then from here, you can just add all the notes as you, you know, want to, or like whatever you want to share with the folks. And then uh, the next step is there is this YAML file called porto.yaml. You open that up. And then you'll see here, this is like the structure of the entire book. And you just want to add your part, um, your the files that you just created. And so like we just created this, that MV, and this, that MD. So once you have all that uh, ready to go, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can preview the book by uh, go into your terminal and doing Porto preview. So this will, like I said, preview the book and you can see here now we have a new section for chapter two and the notes, which are blank because we haven't added anything. And, um, and so uh, you can also do that at the very beginning. And um, as you change things, it, it will actually automatically update. So whenever you save, it will reload and, and add what you just wrote. So um, Quarto Preview can be done at the very beginning. And so when you are about ready to, like you're ready to push up, uh, I can add it here again. Sorry, I'm very new at the terminal. <laughs> you could do Quarto Render. Wanna make sure you render the book and that kind of solidifies all the changes that you've made. Um, and then uh, once it is done, you can do like the way that you usually use Git and push up your changes, like commit your changes, push up your changes. And then that will um, uh, bring your changes up to your local uh, fork um, on GitHub. And once you're ready, like you think everything it, um, is ready and you want to like send it to the R for Data Science admins, you can create a pull request, which they will review and then approve. Um, I have written out these steps in the how to doc uh, the how to page, and it's also on the README of the uh, of the repository. So please take a look. Um, you know, this this is very new, and so if you run into anything, have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Any questions right now? Yeah, thank you, Isabel. So with Quattro, it means um, I can use um, IPYMB Jupyter. Somebody can use R Markdown. Somebody can use QMD within the same book, and everything runs perfectly, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, if for some reason, like one of the chapters you want to use an RMD file, you can just create an RMD file, write it out the way that you normally would, and then when you do Porto render, it will render it. Um, even if there are other documents that are Python notebooks. Yeah, I, I think you catch Layla. Layla is saying she's moving to Cartro. <laughs> yeah, oops. I already have. It was oh, so easy. Yeah, yeah, after yeah. our studio comp. So yeah. <laughs> On my way back to our, from our studio comp, I was like, let me just test this out. So I just like made a Quarto um, QMD on yeah. uh, like stuff I learned from mm -hmm. our studio comp because I had to present it at, at work. And it, it was, there was like no learning curve. It was just like, yeah. do your thing. And it was super easy. And at our studio comp, I like made my little subdomain for Quarto. Uh, at pubs? I forgot what it's called. Yeah, that pub, yeah. whatever the, our pubs is. Um, yeah, it was super easy. Like, yeah, not much to not much to learn. Yeah, thank you, Isabel. I think um, I will stick to using 
uh, Jupyter because you know I use Jupyter for Python, so just use Jupyter to run it. All right, cool. So I think uh, with the time we can go over chapter two. Um, and I'm supposed to. I have a question. Okay, yeah, go on. Okay, I would like to ask. Though she make mention of the Markdown and also uh, Jupyter notebook, so I would like to ask if you are, if you populate the notes, commit your changes, then you make a pull request. So what about if some persons use Markdown, some person use uh, Jupyter Notebook, would there not be any issue when you you are making pull requests back to the repo? Uh, there shouldn't be as long as you're keeping your repo uh, in sync, um, but uh, then there shouldn't be any any issues. So like, and I think like since most of us will be working on separate chapters, hopefully there wouldn't be very many conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just right. gonna, yeah. Make sure like when writing your file that it's like yeah. if, if you're doing chapter three, it says three instead of um, two. Yeah, I think this will really increase and motivate collaboration. So if someone is working on RMMD, somebody is working on Jupyter, you know, so people with Python and different, but so there is no barrier now. So you can just collaborate and do stuff together. All right. So let me share my screen so that I can. Uh, so, yeah, um, so today is basically um, uh, the basic of Python. So everyone, I believe, yeah, we all know this basic, but um, we're going to go through over it um, quickly to see what it contains. Um, yeah, we, uh, I know um, Laila also, she's a Python, Pythonista now. <laughs> okay, but I have one comment. Yes. Why do you have 76 changes that you have not committed? <laughs> what is this, Sham? You say what? You have 76 changes you haven't committed. Where? Look on your left side on the Git, Git icon. Ah, this is not the repo. This is not the repo. Oh, sure. This is not the, um, it's my local. Um, mm -hmm. My local git is not the um, <laughs> yeah. So this is different from <laughs> next book club. How how to use git? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I I basically um, get this from the web. I clone this book. So it is the clone book I'm editing. So because it will show I didn't push to the original book. So that's why you see this. <laughs> right. Um. So yeah, so uh, first thing first, um, he made mention that this book is basically does not cover some stuff, which is like classes and other stuff, object-oriented programming. And he referenced us to some references to go over it, which I think is quite useful. And um, um, that's what we uh, 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 did in our previous club. So um, the book started by introducing Python and some basic stuff about Python. Um, the saying Python is um, an interpreted language, as we know, uh, we need to use interpreter to invoke imp interpreter first and interpret the language, and um, which is one good thing with Python. And um, he also uh, made mention how we can uh, invoke interpreter using Python. So uh, with, uh, let me just, um, uh, so this is basically how we can invoke interpreter for Python. and. Uh, when we invoke it using Python, we can see here uh, how we manage environment. Uh, for example, here you can see package uh, package by Conda Forge. So remember last week we talked about using Conda Forge, which is basically somehow include many updated packages rather than using Anaconda. Uh, so you can see if you are using Anaconda, uh, to, you can see this is Conda, Anaconda or some stuff like that. So this is how we can um, actually activate um, our interpreter. But also, um, we can use many stuff like, um, uh, you know, do our basic stuff like addition or whatever. But he also made mention that um, you can basically also uh, run Python uh, file from the uh, terminal. So if we want to go out from this guy, we can basically run some files from terminal. Um, so some people you can see here, I just uh, type Python and now I. Um, invoke the Python interpreter. 
sometimes you may see people um, use Python 3 here um, uh, to invoke the interpreter here. Uh, the reason why is that um, uh, in some system, when you say Python, it will use the default Python in your system, which is Python 2. So you may basically use Python 3, but uh, I have already mapped uh, from my aliases um, that Python should map to Python 3. Um, we can also use terminal to uh, run a file, um, uh, any file. For example, here I have a file called, um, um, I have a file called hello world, I think, uh, which contains this stuff, right? Um, so it contains this. So we can, if I want to run this file, I can basically run Python uh, call this file, and now I can run this file. So this is running Python from the interpreter. Um, but he also made mention that uh, um, uh, because Python interpreter basically, as we saw, does not actually have some kind of um, really cool thing to do some uh, some advanced stuff. So uh, a project started to, and uh, it gave us to what we call IPython. So IPython is basically um, a kind of, uh, you can see an enhanced interactive Python. So it's enhanced version of a Python interpreter and you can do a lot of stuff with that. For example, you can see uh, this is more or less um, um, what we can do with, um, um, with uh, for example, you can do this and you can see in, uh, in Python, uh, in IPython, we have something like this, but uh, in normal, uh, in the normal uh, Python, uh, we have, uh, no. In the normal Python, we have this uh, this thing too. Three. And, uh, it's not one plus. Uh, it's not uh, using numbers. So this is how we can uh, basically differentiate between. So basically, he just introduced um, what is IPython and what is um, um, uh, Python uh, Python uh, interpreter. And the next thing he talked about. Um, Jupyter notebooks and saying that uh, we can see here we can invoke IPython, but Jupyter notebook is empowered by IPython. So when you are running Jupyter, for example, here we are running Jupyter notebook, then at the backbone is IPython that empowers it. So IPython is really uh, powerful. Um, so if we want to run um, scripts in IPython as well, uh, what we can do is uh, instead, for example, we can use this, uh, uh, not this, we can use this command, we can say run. Yep, so we can, so it can run this. So uh, you can see if you are using Python, um, uh, normal interactive um, interpreter, you can just call the script with Python, but uh, if you're using IPython, you can use this. Um, this. So that's what he discussed, uh, introduced at the introduction. Um, now, um, he take us through the basic of I, IPython, um, uh, meaning saying that uh, you can do a lot of stuff. For example, uh, number one, he says you can do what is called um, uh, run. You can still run block of code as you use in uh, normal editor. You can also, you can have um, tab completion. So let me run this guy. So if we look at this, um, let me run this. So if we can see here, this is just, um, something I create a function, add number, add number. Okay, this another function, this another function. Oh, they are still the same thing, these functions. <laughs> yeah, they are still the same thing, maybe, I don't know. So you can see here, um, I have a function called add number, and here I have a class called add number. Oh, add numbers here, and here is add number. So what he's talking about is, um, you can have what is called um, tab completion. So for example, here, if I um, I create this function here, this is class. Now I can basically do um, okay. Let me do this. I can basically, for example, um, def add numbers. Um, I have these. So in VS Code, um, you can have this kind of um, um, uh, stuff that try to predict what you want to do. So if you have a function, you can see that, but um, we'll see what I mean by the other stuff. Um, here we have um, a, a, a class called date time. Now, if we want to uh, use this stuff here, we can have something like this. So if we call the time here, 
we can see the moment we put dot, um, we can see many stuff that uh, object that of this the time object. So this is something that you can use, but if it is at, in, in, at the, uh, your IPython or in uh, Python interpreter, you can use tab to see uh, tab completion. So this is basically about tab completion. Um, but um, here you can see I create a class here. I can use this as well. So if I have a class here, I can say a class a is equal to um, add number. So here I create a class. Um, I create an object called a. Now, if I want to use this class, for example, add here, I have a method called add. Here you can see I can say a one. Um, okay, let me run this guy. I have a. Now I have this. So you can see here this method comes add. So I can just need to. So if you are using Python, I mean Jupyter notebook, it has what is called IntelliSense. So you can install the extension from here, IntelliSense. And now you don't need to use the tab he is talking about. So this is what he is talking about, the future of tab completion. Uh, you just need to press tab and to do that. Um, yeah, so, but also um, if you look at this, we have this uh, class. Now there is something that uh, some method or object, they have, they are private, they cannot be shown. So if I have this uh, dead time, um, for me to show some of the private method, I need to put underscore. So you will see this private method here. But uh, if I don't put this, um, you can see or what we're gonna see is only, um, you only, you're gonna see only the uh, method that are not private. So this is what he uh, discussed about the private method. Okay, so that is uh, basic. I believe we all know that. That's why I am just looking uh, going faster. So there is uh, some notion of um, introspection, um, some Python object. So we, as we know, um, in Python, um, everything is in, in Python is object. So um, let me clear this guy. So everything in Python is object. So what this means? So um, let's assume here we have um, um, a, a, an object called message. And now um, we can have this variable called hello, and now we can use this comma to show some of the stuff that is included in this object. So this is called introspection, and that is trying to introspect what is uh, in the variable. So you can use this with variable, with functions, with module, with everything you can do that. So you can see here, I have um, uh, a method here, and now with this, I can now introspect this method. So you can see here, I can see the name of the method, you know, um, what it does, you know, the, you know, this is uh, the stop, the argument. Um, we can also use here, you can see I import OS, which is all that I can use this introspection and you can see. So this is just um, this uh, command for introspection. Um, we can use double com, uh, this uh, double question mark for introspection as well. So what's the difference between the two? So we can see this is the same function I call add numbers and uh, it return this. But remember here, I have what is called, um, um, what is the name of um Doc string. Doc string, so yeah. So here I have a doc string, right? So if I call this with a single um, question mark, you can see this is what it gives me. But when I give a double question mark, you can see it gives me my doc string. So this means that the double question marks give us more information about the single question mark. So that's basically what he discussed about some of these uh, items. But we do have um, other, um, uh, so this stuff, they are called what we call um, magic command. Uh, we have more magic command besides these two. For example, we have what you call here. You can see this is a magic command. And uh, you can see this is my add numbers function. So um, when I call this dev, what it basically does, it will give me the doc string only of the uh, class or functions. Um, no, no, this is um, give the function. Um, we show the function definition. So this show the function definition. Yeah. So you can see this is a function definition, right? So if we go back to this add numbers, um, uh, where is this function? Add numbers, you see? So what the function definition, right? This is the function definition, add numbers A, B. This is what we call function definition here. So this will show you the function definition in P def. We also have another P doc, right? So this is a magic command that basically shows you the doc string. 
So only doxtrin of the, so if you don't want to see the code, you don't want to see everything, um, you just only want to see the doxtrin of your function so that you can understand what this function is doing whatsoever, you can just use this magic command. But also, if you don't want to see the doxtrin, you just want to see the source code of the object or of the function of the class, you can use this p-source. And now this will, yeah, I mean, this will give you the code, everything, just like the way we do the previous. So these are different kind of stuff that will help you along the way, just trying to inspect your object, because we said in Python, everything in object, your class is object, your variable, everything in Python is object. So that's basically about inspection. Um, yeah, um, you can also use, um, he discussed about uh, using this wild character to uh, basically do some kind of uh, introspection of everything that start with everything and load. And, you know, you can see this is some, yeah. So that's, that's uh, yes. Do you know if there are any tricks to get the arguments of a function? Because for me, like one in VS Code, that IntelliSense is a godsend, but sometimes it goes away. And if I, I don't remember what the arguments of the function are or in what order, because you ah. know, I found it sometimes tricky about, you know, that which functions, you know, like they have to be in order um, and I have to Google the documentation. So I, I was wondering if there was like a magic trick to get the... Um. Oh, all I know is you, if, if I see yeah. it, you can see. But sometimes this. that goes away. You know what I mean? Like if you move your cursor without without filling it in, I don't mm -hmm. know how sometimes I can get that little tooltip ah, to come back. P, well, that, percent, that percent mm -hmm. PDF should do that, right? It should give you the whole call signature. Yeah, this, what about this one that I just showed? This one. Um, yeah, that's the one. This one. Can you do that on a different function so I can see? Okay, so let's say we have um, dev. Um, uh, or you, um, can you just do like, you can do one that already exists. So like PD dot data frame, for example. PD. So, no, like from pandas. So pandas dot data frame, okay. like one that already exists in the, so you don't have to write a function from scratch. So yeah, I import one. That's what do you want? So uh, I guess percent p def on okay. data frame or something. Uh oh, okay. So hmm. the capital D a, data frame has a capital D or something. Yeah, or that. That's fine. No, wait. That's that's your own function. <laughs> yeah. So which function do you want? Um, maybe read CSV. Yeah, whatever. Any any one of the pandas one, that's fine. I just want to see what it looks like. You have import pandas twice. And PD on line one. Ah. <laughs> you see. Hmm. Yeah, uh, you have to do pd dot. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's not uh -huh. the right function, but uh, I I'm not sure. Um, but um, um, I mean, this is an actual. This is a pandas function. Yeah. Uh, I'm not well, sure. Yeah, like, you see all of this, like yeah. all of this file path, blah, blah, blah. I want to call that explicitly. You want to print it? Yeah, like I, I want to be able to see, you see how many arguments there are? So it's like, I want to be able to know what exists without me having to go and Google the documentation all the time. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how in R you can yeah, just do a question yeah, mark yeah. and then the oh, little okay. help yeah. comes up in our studio that tells you like, Ah, okay, what about this? What about this? Um, in Python, we use help, right? Um, what about this? That's it. That's what I wanted. I don't. I, I don't know what the help function is. <laughs> ah. Okay. All right. Good to know. Yeah, but are, are you using BS Code? Yeah. 
I mean, why don't you use this like just to see this, you know, <laughs> scrolling? I do, know? I do, I do. Yeah. But sometimes it just like goes away. It's it's and... kind of tricky, you know. Like I don't know. For me, sometimes it just like the tooltip flies away, and I can't figure out how to get it back. <laughs> nice. I see. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, right, I think so... the health things can work. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that was um, helpful. Isabel yeah. is talking about something. Oh, this thing works without the parentheses for the. This guy works. Isabel tried. We, we after moving the. Oh, I think it needs a V at the end. Oh, it's not working. Uh, oh. See, it, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. But I think it's not vivid, mm -hmm. like it doesn't. Yeah, I think oh. the other one was. was oh, better. yeah, yeah, it does what um, Layla is talking about because it gives you only, because fdef is giving you the function definition, right? So this is a function definition we're all with everything inside it. Um, the help yeah. one, the help one is not even what Layla is asking. The help one gives you the whole stuff about the read about the functions even the doxin the explanation not only the function definition yeah this is that this is exactly what i want like yes, i want to yes. be able to just say and you see how the colors for none mm -hmm. versus different yeah. kind of argument so that that's perfect yeah. mm -hmm. all right good to know so helpful. Okay. thank you thank you um right so yeah so that's about magic commands but there are more magic commands so for example, if you, we already know if we are working in our terminal, we can use PWD and uh, just, but if you are working on a Jupyter notebook, what you can do is just use this uh, percent and now you can use that. So you can see it gives you this stuff, right? But you can see here, we can still use this guy, right? Without using this, right? So why this? So there is what is called auto magic that you turn on and turn off auto magic. What this means is that if you, I run this guy, you can see that now I turn off auto magic. So when I run this guy, this will not work. But when I turn this guy on, it means I don't even need any more to just put this, um, this sign. So I can just, what, any command that, I can just run any command the way I can run commands in my terminal. So if you wanna do that, you can at the beginning turn on auto magic so that you don't need to do everything uh, just like that. Um, yeah, so we have another um, um, time it, which basically time the, which is auto magic, uh, magic command with time the uh, time it takes to run a command. We have this LS, um, we already know that if you can remove that, so you can see it will run this guy like this. So this is basically some of the, um, uh, uh, this is some of the uh, uh, magic command we have. Also, you remember in matplotlib, we have this uh, matplotlib to show the inline command, which is also the, mat, uh, the magic command as well. So, uh, which allows you to show this uh, inline. Right. So, um, there is one more thing. So, if you remember here, we, have, we are using Jupyter. One thing with Jupyter, some people may find it, is if I run this guy, you can see I can only see the final result of, right, from the um, output. What about this guy? The result is not here. This is telling us the Jupyter the output only the last result. So you cannot see the previous one. What you can do, you can activate this with this, something like this. You can say, no, act, um, print everything. So we have different kind of argument here is, oh, when I run this guy, you can see I have my two, out, um, right? By default, it is last. So in Jupyter, by default, it's last. So when I run this guy, you can see, and it gives me the last output. So sometimes if you are wondering why do you need to, uh, uh, why do you need to have the uh, output, um, uh, all the output in the cells, you can activate it using this command. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's about that. Um, anyone wants to add something before we proceed? Okay, so yeah. So um, what he discussed next is about the Python, um, uh, basic, um, what he discussed about um, using um, indentation. We already know that uh, Python use indentation. Um, and uh, whatsoever you see this colon, it says the next line, it ex in, in expect indentation. So by default, 
we um, it is recommended even the book to use full line in the indentation. So, but uh, when we have this, the moment I put enter, you can see it already used four line indentation. So this is what Python used to show us um, uh, indentation. He even said, love it or hate it. <laughs> I really laugh with this. Significant white space is in fact a life of Python programmers. While it may seem boring at first, you will be happily grow to accustom it. So this kind of white space, it really give um, people Ton of people coming by turn from RS. Sometimes they say, why do we need this for? I mean, you know, you get a lot of errors. Um, yeah, so he proceed with talking about what is called multiple line statement. So here we have A, B, C, we all assign um, variable value, but you can see Python are not terminators like other program language. Maybe you can use this, you know, to terminate the end of this line. Um, so Python doesn't need that. But you can use this uh, semicolon if you want to put everything in a single line so that um, you uh, write them in a single line. Um, what he proceeded is talking about Python in everything Python and in everything in Python is object. So whatsoever you do Python class, you know, everything is object. So what he's saying is that um, what you use with one class, with one object, you can use with any other object. There is no difference. So that's what he meant. Um, he proceeded with talking about um, 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 object uh, function, uh, how we can do what is called call. So here we can see here we have A is a variable, which is a object A we created. Now, if we want to uh, basically um, um, assess some method based on this object, which is, um, uh, which is um, a list, we can do this, um, we can say A dot, um, you can see many method for the list will be available here. So here I say available, um, uh, six, so I append six to the list. Now, when I call this, I add now six, you can see I have this. So this means that when you want to call a function um, for any object, you will use a dot notation. So this is a dot notation. Just call your object, use dot. That is how you can assess method for a particular object. Um, but what about if I have this A is equal to um, maybe, um, 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 string, something like this, we can see here we have a string. Now, if I have this guy, I can see that when I say a dot, I run this guy, when I say a dot, you can see this gives me method different from the previous one, right? So when I call this guy first, uh, I have a, which is uh, list, but uh, when I call a dot, you can see append that is a method or clear, which will clear this uh, list. So it, it will invoke method related to that object. So here, when we, it, we invoke this capitalize, it will capitalize, am I correct? Oh, okay, I need to run this guy. So when I call this, um, I don't know what is Kelsfold, I don't know. So string, what is Kelsfold? Um, anyone knows what is Kelsfold? return a version of string suitable for caseless comparison. Mm. Okay, also, so, um, so a dot uh, capitalize, so we have this, it will, um, I don't know what this does. Capitalize, I thought it will capitalize everything here, but it's not doing so. Okay, so let's move on to uh, another thing here. You can see here, this is a function. We created um, a function. And now for you to call a function, you just need to provide the name of the function and now the argument of the function. So here, that's why we have, um, so this is called function, calling a function. For you to call a function, just use the name of the function. For you to assess method of a uh, method uh, from object, we use dot notation and now I said those method. Um, he move on and discussing um, variables and argument person. So what he's talking about here is that um, we can see here we have A is this, and now we say A is equal to B. We just like assign. And now when we have print the B, we can see B is still uh, one, two, three. But what about if I update A? So when I update A, append A, append A three, I'm appending A with value of three. So here you can see here when I append it, I have one, two, three, three. But this um, update, um, what about, so B is also updated. You can see I have not up, uh, updated this. So this is what he's calling, um, as, uh, um, in some languages, the assignment, if B will cause the date to be copied. So if you do something in other languages, 
if you assign A to B, then you are copying the content of B, but in Python, what is called binding. So if you do this, you are binding. So you are binding this A to B. So whatsoever you use to uh, A, it's now reflect um, to B. So this is something we should know. Using assignment to assign something uh, it does not actually copy uh, stuff. Okay. Anyone wants to add something before we proceed? Uh, okay. A way to not have them bind it. <laughs> like, what if you want A and B to be different? Do you just have to do um, a whole other, like, just make sure that you don't have B equals A anywhere? Well, did you talk about mutables yet? I was AFK for a bit there. Hmm? Did you talk about mutable versus immutable types? <laughs> uh mutable uh, it's only really the mutable types for this matters and yeah you can use copy like that yeah so here um i think um sr value are talking about copy right maybe let's look at it so here you can see what about so you can see b is one two three i see awesome thank you yeah so here we copy um what a is we just like um yeah so it is always dangerous to try to assign the value and you know you can just copy it so that um yeah thank you yeah okay so there is something here they call us dynamic reference which is strong types so what this is selling is uh, he talked about saying that python is not um uh people say that python is not a uh, type language or whatsoever uh, because you can see in some python in program like C++, I think you can need to say NT, NTA is supposed to five, right? You just need to, you need to declare, this is, yeah, I think this is called declare variable or something like that. So you need to say that, but in Python, like, you know, like R we use, you just need to call the name, the variable and assign the value. It is automatically behind the scene. Python is assigning the type of that variable, but it abstract this thing. This is one of the reason why Python is slow programming language because behind the scene, it is doing a lot of acts. So if you say A equals to five, five, and you run this, behind this interpreter will now assign the, um, the right five to five, which is A, it should be integer. So if you look at this, A is, um, a is equals to five. Um, I mean, A is integer, right? Um, when we use this guy, a, um, a is equals string. So what is happening? Behind the scene, um, there is this loading. I mean, in nutshell, this is what are the, reason why pattern is slow they use what you call uh i i forgot the name this kind of uh, uh stop that it takes to combat this object from here to make it fully stop but um uh if we look at this guy we use this um for example five plus five it gives us um 11 but what we when we use this um guy um we can see that um this gives us an you know so python says this are two different things and cannot add them. so in some programming language what will happen is that this six will be type cast maybe to a uh, string and now it will be five five or oh, this five will be type cast you know automatically so you can see in some language the string five might be implicitly converted or cast um, i'm not sure what is happening in r um, in r what happens uh, if we try to do this i forgot actually uh, um anyone can have us in r if i try to I think in r, r is going to pass it to a certain class eh. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So in other languages, so in Python, such implicit casting are not allowed. This regard, we say Python is a strongly typed language. So in this case, Python is strongly typed language. You cannot do that. Um, oh. So in Python, in R, you have error as well. Okay. Pythonless a non-numeric argument to binary. Mm. So string kind of trumps all with coercion. Mm -hmm. So like. If you do string plus int, it's going to give you this error. Mm -hmm. If you do string plus string, then it's going to, it'll probably, co it'll coerce to a string. Okay. I don't know about, I can't remember R actually. It was kind of sad. <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> R. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So, yeah. So we can also check object instance, what class that object is. For example, we want to make sure, maybe you are, receiving input from the user and you want to make sure the user what types is a string or is an integer so you can use this function It's instance you put the object and you put the class i mean the data type you want so here we are checking whether um 
these guys are string. So you can see the first, the A is string, yeah, but the B is not a string, right? So this is some ways to check your, uh, and also you can check um, two things. Um, if you inspect your user to input, whether just a number, a number, not a string. So you can check whether it is integer, whether it is float. So you can use these two guys, um, int and float, to make sure that what the user is imputing is something um, of real values, not uh, a string. Um, yeah, so that's what he discussed. Yeah, anyone? Okay, anything? Um, that's what he discussed there. And also he discussed something attribute and method, which we already discussed here. So for example, here, um, we have a, a variable B equals this Kaduna, which is stated in my country, Nigeria. Um, so what he was saying here is that um, we have for each object, we have it is attribute and method. So here I have this B, which is an object. Now I have different method for this object, which I've already talked about. This is um, it's lower, it's method regarding to that. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's about the object uh, method. I've already showed that. Um, um, so here we have this, uh, uh, this uh, stuff, uh, DIR. Um, it also shows you everything related to particular, particular object. So here you can see, um, uh, for example, um, when I have this, this object, so now in BS code, I can just use this B, um, um, I can use B dot to see all this stuff, right? But um, if you don't have this stuff, you can use this DIR, so it will show you everything here. But as you can see here, it starts with the um, private classes and stuff like that, and now the normal ones are shown at the end. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what is this? Uh, okay. Um, so here we move um, to something we also used to um, importing Python modules. So um, we know um, what is module in Python. Basically, it's just like um, uh, a file with some code, right? So here, I think um, I just have a simple file which is called math module. So here you can see I have a module which is called math module. So I have two functions called addition and mult, and now I have a variable called pi. So this is a module. So how can I import this module um, to do, for example, um, addition, multiplication and stuff in my program? So this is how we import it. So you say import math module. And now if I want to accept a function in that module, I can just name the module uh, math module dot the name of the function I want to. So this is five. So when I run this guy, it will give me 10, right? Um, so this is how they do it. But equivalently, maybe you don't want to type, uh, you want to do a lot of, um, uh, uh, use a lot of uh, math functions inside this MOS model. So you can import the, um, uh, you can import the addition here directly. So here we can say from math module, import addition. So here I don't need to use math module. I can just put addition to use that. Alternatively, we can use um, uh, a keyword from math module import addition as add. So I don't need to use even addition if it is long. So the reason why is to avoid conflicts. Sometimes there is a conflict if you have functions, you are importing a function from a particular module and you have the same name of the mod, uh, function in your program, then you can rename it, give it like alias so that you can just, so you can see here now when I use L add, I'm still assessing the uh, add function in that. Um, another thing, which is what I showed here, you can import the whole module as uh, 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 maybe this is Landy. You don't want to, yeah, just we use import pandas and speedy. You can use that, but you can also import everything. So from math module, import everything, which is not really recommended. So if I import everything here, um, I can just accept the function here, um, the function inside the module, which is mold here. We'll use the. Um, I need to import everything here. So when I import everything, I can. So this is basically how we can import modules uh, from Python. Um, anyone with question or want to add something? Oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, we are running out of time. So um, assessing, um, oh, you can assess an attribute. So if we look at this here, we have two functions, definite uh, addition and this, we have a variable here, which is pi. So for us to add, um, to, um, I said the variable, we still use the same thing. So you can see I import math module, then I need to call the module dot this too. This is how we can accept the variable. Um, yeah, so this is basically um, binary operators, we, which we know. 
Um, he talks about mutable and immutable objects. So in Python, some objects are mutable, some are not mutable, meaning you cannot change the content. So here we can see when we have this um, a list here, uh, I create a list with four, two, four, five. Um, I can update the list. I can add one to the end of the list. So this is mutable. You can update it is content. But um, uh, we have what is called tuple. Uh, a tuple is not a mutable. So you can see here, at least we use a square bracket here. This is what doing it. But we have an, another variable called tuple. So here we have tuple. You can see here we use square bracket with donate tuple. But we cannot update this tuple. Um, so when you try to do this, this will give you an error. This tuple is says to be immutable object. List is said to be mutable because we can update its content. Um, he discussed about various um, uh, scalar types of Python. We have non, string, byte, float, boolean. So in Python, we have only float and integer. Rather in, in R, we have many things to represent real number, right? But in Python, we have only float and um, integer. I think we don't have double. So we have um, these guys to, to import um, arbitrary precision integer, but this is, uh, no, there is no separate double type here. So um, yeah, so this is how we can normal calculation. And here, this is a string. Um, yeah, string is also immutable. So remember, string is also immutable. Um, when we have this, uh, we cannot update string. Um, so string is object. Um, you can, it also have a lot of it is method. So here is a replace method that can replace uh, uh, the content of string. So uh, with this, so what is saying here is that we have this guy, um, we have A here, no, no. We have A here is this, uh, but um, what, I, what we mean here is that we can have another object here. Um, so here you can see uh, the previous one here is, um, uh, we have string here and longer string. So meaning uh, you can do what is called replace. So uh, it's not updating the real one, but replacing. So you can see we say string are immutable, but here we are doing something to replace. We are creating a new object rather than the, your, so uh, the, the main idea is, uh, the main trick is that you cannot update the real um, um, tuple, but you can copy it and create a new one from the existing one. So that's valid. So you can see here, we can, we now create a new one. Um, so we can do a lot of thing, find conversion of Python objects, uh, type casting and stuff like that. So here you can see I have um, 5.6 and now I can type cast it to string. Um, uh, yeah, so one thing you notice is here, like um, when I have this guy, um, you can see this give me a string, right? So yeah, I, because I do type cast, but when I print that thing, you can see it gives me something like this. Someone will see like, um, it's no strings, but it's string, yeah, just printing the content inside. So you should take care about this sometime. It may create confusion. Um, yeah, this is something slicing. We can come over it. it uh, he discussed about slide in the chapter. Um, adding string, which we already know. Oh, that's another thing, string formatting, which is really helpful in Python. So what is string formatting? So here we have uh, a variable called age. So when you want to do um, um, in R, we call it, uh, what do you call in R, this stuff? Um, in tidy bus, glue, right? Glue. So here you can see we have F, F this guy, and now we put string here. And now the variable, any variable, any object, we can put it inside this curly braces, right? So it can now input it. So this is really helpful and useful. Um, we use, um, yeah, I really love F string. It was really tedious in Python before you use a lot of, I mean, you know, in olden Python, there are a lot of stuff, but this F string is really helpful. I really love F string as well. Uh, it um, actually encapsulates many, uh, you can see a lot of other variants of um, uh, string manipulation in Python, which is uh, really complicated, but F string um, actually makes things easier. So if there is another, for example, here I have three, three two dot this, I want to have uh, two, two decimal places. What you can do is still the same thing, but we need to put price, that is, and this one, and now how many decimal places, two F. So this will give me two decimal places, you can see that. Um, yeah, so there is a lot of stuff with the uh, pi, uh, F string. Um, this is also what we call string templating. Um, so for example, I can create a template. So this is a template. The first one, the second thing uh, was something like that. Um, this is just a template that you can call a template that format, you can call a function. So here you already define what it should be. So if you give anything here, um, here you define the second object, one S, 
you define it. So what is uh, this? It means to format the first argument as a plot point number with two decimal places. This one dot s means to format the second argument as a string. This one 2D to format this argument as exact integer. So here you can see at this, when I have this, it would, okay, I didn't run this guy. So when I run this guy, I can see um, it format. So this is something. Uh, um, lastly, he discussed, uh, we have three more minutes about uh, what is called byte code. Um, you can see here at uh, this, now you can encode um, the, uh, you can encode uh, stuff in the, uh, so now we use UTF-8 by default, so you can encode different stuff. So now you can see here I have a val, uh, something called val, but if I want to encode it and see its representation in UTF-8, I can encode it like this. So this is UTF um, representation. Um, uh, when I go, so you can see it is byte because the UTF representation in byte representation, right? Uh, he made mention about some historical stuff that in older Python, string uh, whatsoever, uh, he just mentioned some stuff. And now you can decode to bring it back uh, to original stuff. Uh, he discussed a lot about this and Boolean, uh, this is typecasting. Um, you use the, if we have a variable here S and now I can convert it to float, I can uh, convert it to integer, to Boolean and stuff like that. We also have uh, uh, none in Python. And lastly, here he talk about dates and time which basically here we can see here, we import date, um, we import date time, we import date, we import time, and now we create, create something like this DT. And now we can, uh, DT we can see now is object. So from this object, we can assess many methods from it. DT.day will give us the day, DT.minute will give us the minute, DT will second. So if I call this guy, he can give me the day because 2011, 10, which date, this is the date, and I can call um, the minute, um, with minute, uh, 30 minutes. So this is basically introducing us some concept in Python, but uh, um, yeah, we can, yeah. I mean, the, the last one he talked about is control flow. So in Python, we have if, elif, and else. So we already know what the if is, and uh, we have else if, elif in Python, in R we use else if, here yeah, we have elif, you put them all together. Um, the last one is else, um, yeah. Um, we have for loops, um, the for loops give you this for loop in, you have a collection, something called iterator, which you will see a lot in the sessions. Uh, uh, anything iterator like string, like, you know, like a list, like tuple, anything you can put it here. So this is a uh, for loop, the structure. Um, we also have um, um, another keyword that you can use in the for loop, what he, which is to continue. So if you are looping in the loop, you can basically use um, uh, use continue to keep going and break to break the loop. Um, yeah, so you, he also discussed a while loop, which you can use if you know uh, 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 some information prior to the loop. Um, yeah, he also discussed about a function called range, which we see, which allows us to create um, um, numbers. Uh, for example, here I can see um, I have a range, I uh, mean zero to 10, it create uh, 10 numbers, right? Um, so um, yeah, so finally this um, chapter uh, introduced us to basic of Python and IPython and Jupyter. And um, I believe we all um, uh, uh, go through it if we haven't. Uh, the next chapter will start uh, also, I think the basic of Python. Um, yeah, until I think if we go to chapter three, where we we'll start looking more um, stuff related to data analysis and yeah, related to that. Right. Sorry for going over one minute, um, but this is what I got. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Any question or any contribution? All right. Um, all of them, any question or contribution? No question. I think it was a good presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you all very much uh, for joining. Yeah, thank um, you, appreciate it. Thank you all, um, yeah. So thank you all guys and uh, thank you for joining and uh, we see you next week. Um, thank you very much.